Um, my name is Mark. I'm one of the founders and vice president of marketing and sales, and I'm happy to give you an introduction of the company. So in summary, we are about 12 years old now, established 2008. We are a leader in light controlling components. So several product families that have in common that they move around and do something with light. We're a global company. We have 28 sales partners in 30 countries. Um, total group counts 138 employees, the most of them in Switzerland. Um, we do have a factory in Slovakia for manufacturing, but also some electronics, firmware, software development there, and uh, some people in sales offices in Asia. Um, our markets are quite diverse. We'll go into more details behind, uh, later. Uh, medical and industrial is kind of our core business, and we are you know, moving into um, fancier things like augmented virtual reality or automotive. And the company is privately held. Um, founders still have the vast majority. Um, so globally, yeah, we have, as I mentioned, Dieticon is where we're at home here in the canton of Zurich, and uh, we do a lot here, still production of a lot of products, especially the liquid products are all uh, produced here. Uh, then in Trnava in Slovakia, we have manufacturing of more like labor intensive uh, products, more higher volume things, um, along with the software development. And then the offices in Asia are in uh, Taipei and in Korea, um, which is quite important to have uh, a local footprint there to, uh, to be um, support well our Asian customers. Now, our products, they're really a combination of optics and actuators. So optics are like lenses, mirrors, prisms, diffusers, glass windows. Um, those components have been around for decades, I mean, centuries, right? Um, but what we do is we move them around and we use actuators like voice coils, or uh, you, we use reluctance force as a concept, uh, which does not use magnets, for example. We also have a technology called electroactive polymers, uh, which is used for uh, moving objects. And so when these two things meet, uh, we generally can provide customers um, unique solutions, which are generally compact and um, you know have less mechanics than a traditional way of solving problems uh, in this field. Um, so, why do we get up in the morning? We want to enable optical innovation. Um, so a few things we have enabled is compact and fast autofocus, three-dimensional laser processing, low-cost 4K projectors. Um, we're not just an R&D company, like a design house, which we could be, but we choose to be a producing company. Um, so we actually deliver key components like the lenses, speckle reducers, beam steering devices that um, help then the customer achieve this innovation. And in order not to reinvent the wheel each time, we have a, a base of platform technologies, especially we're good in membranes and liquids, um, electroactive polymers I mentioned, and these actuators. Um, so combining these platforms, we can create new solutions by customizing them also to customers. And um, we actually have quite an impressive patent portfolio. So 70 distinctly new patents filed since 2008. Um, which is also an asset for us. Every now and then we do some licensing, um, but it just kind of shows how we, we just take on projects where there's actually not yet a good solution available and come up with something. And then very often this can be filed as a patent. So now to the products. Um, what we are known for most uh, after being about 10 years on the market uh, with these kind of products is um, focus tunable lenses also called liquid lenses or shape changing polymer lenses. So the basis here is a, you see in the animation, a container which has a liquid inside and the membrane that covers it. And this ring that goes up and down, when you push that ring into the membrane, it flexes uh, the surface and you get a positive lens. If you pull on it, you get a negative lens. And this movement um, is usually done with a voice coil. Uh, which is very fast. So that's kind of our core technology, mimicking the uh, operation of the human eye when it focuses by kind of changing the shape of a lens. Um, then another product family we've been doing since about eight years is uh, laser speckle reducers. So in the animation, you see like when there's a laser and the camera involved, usually you have a lot of noise. Also with the eyes, when you see a laser on a screen, you will see little dots. 
and this is um, annoying or can give headache or a, a bad feeling. And if you're doing microscopy or some metrology, this will reduce your resolution. Now, uh, if the exposure time is long enough, you can actually trick the system by using a moving diffuser to smear away those speckles. Basically, you average them over the exposure time and the eye is quite slow with 60 hertz. So if you move something at about 100 hertz, you can kind of remove those speckles and get better image quality when laser is used as a light source. Then 2D mirrors are tip tilting uh, mirrors, so they can tilt in both axes rather fast. Um, we have another video later to show how they move. And that can be used for beam steering, mainly using lasers. Um, but also, for example, if you have a camera and a mirror like that, you can you can move the field of view laterally and um, you know expand your field of view. And that could be more interesting than using a wide angle lens or using multiple cameras. Um, and then the fourth product family is the uh, what we call pixel shifters or extended pixel resolution actuators. It's actually not more than a tilting glass plate. Uh, when you tilt the glass plate and go through it, your, your light will be shifted. Um, it is not beam steering where you change the angle of the light, it is beam shifting where you just give it an offset. And this can be used to slightly offset an image um, either projected or taken in a camera by like half a pixel. And if you do this in four directions, you can increase the resolution of a system. So uh, here a bit the same products in a different uh, or on the, shown on the timeline. So we started 2010 with the first products and really have evolved from there to figure out, you know, what does the market really need? Um, how do we have to improve our products to uh, solve different types of solutions? So we then have released, you know, uh, the first lens was without any uh, threading. So we have a, th a connector, threads on it, so it's easy to use. We put in a, a one version with um, optical feedback for high power lasers. Then we went bigger in size, we went smaller in size, we updated our mechanical lens. So we're evolving our products as we, we move forward. And um, yeah, with the speckle reduction and the other products, we keep adding uh, to our portfolio. Um, so we can, uh, we've been expanding over time uh, on all these products. Now, I quickly show you the, as you are engineers, you might maybe want to know a bit more about what's actually the benefit and how does this work. So I have one slide again per product to show a bit more technical features. Uh, the liquid lenses, uh, they are possible in aperture sizes from about 3 to 30 millimeters. Uh, that can actually be quite large, especially for augmented reality. Uh, there's a desire for large lenses, which comes with challenges. Um, the liquid will, you know, uh, if you put the lenses upright, you would usually get um, a change of shape of that liquid lens due to gravity. Um, but actually for that, we have found a very nice solution last year, um, done a very nice patent on that. So we can actually now solve this and propose really high quality, also large aperture lenses, which was not obvious for quite a while. Um, the lenses are very fast. Response times are in the like 2 to 20 millisecond range, depending on the size of the lens. So you can really do a lot of focusing. Also, the, the cycles are very high with about a billion cycles. So you can cycle continuously uh, for many years. Actually, you can think of the lens more like a loudspeaker, um, where you would be able to listen to music for decades. Um, our lens is an optical loudspeaker with a similar behavior. So there's actually no typical, uh, you know, mode of defect uh, that happens and they're very reliable and can do many cycles. Optically quite interesting is the fact that they have low dispersion. So the liquid we use is quite unique. It has an Abbey number over 100, which means that you do not have color separation when using our lens. And that means you can just place it into an existing optical system and don't need to worry too much about color breakup and having to re-optimize your design. That's very useful. And uh, to guarantee a high repeatability, what we also provide is um, thermal sensing inside the lens so we can compensate for thermal effects which are there because of the liquid, um, but they're well understood and they're linear and they can be nicely compensated. So we also get a high repeatability. So you can calibrate something once and don't have to 
we do that calibration too often. Applications will come a bit later, okay? I'll have plenty of them. Then the laser speckle reducers, um, again on the left, the principles, so these local interferences that you get on the screen, you can remove by moving a diffuser at a reasonable speed. Uh, what you see in the top is the uh, speckle reducer, which has reluctance force as a actuator. Um, you can actually see there's um, this little coil. When we push current through the coil, it generates magnetic flux and these two teeth they are at the moment misaligned in the off state, but they will want to close and align to minimize the energy. And then if you give this a pulse, it will close. If you let go, it will swing back. And then the diffuser actually starts resonating um, on a steel spring. And the unique thing here is that we get a high Q factor. That means a very nice resonance. We don't even have to put in too much energy to get that going. Um, Second coil is actually even there to pick up uh, feedback so we can close loop control the resonance and have a very re reliable motion of this diffuser. Um, so the solution then is very compact. It's super thin. Okay, what you see is a fairly large diffuser also. It's been designed initially for um, cinema with laser as a light source, but is now also used in other applications. Um, so then it's a very long lifetime because this system is a steel spring that is moving. There's no friction. It can hardly break that. So also okay for harsh environments uh, and low power. Um, the mirror tip tilts in two axes. Um, and the specialty about this mirror is it has a large angle. So plus minus 25 degrees and a large clear aperture. Um, this is way bigger and more angled than you would get from MEMS type devices, which are silicon based. So that's a competing technology, which is kind of like in the maybe up to five or six millimeter clear aperture range. And in this large aperture range, we will be competing against um, galvometers. But the galvometers are one dimensional. So you first have maybe a 15 millimeter galvo as a first axis. And then your second galvo that comes later has to be much bigger because you already have to cover the field, expanded field of view. So you need two galvometers of which the second is very big and this whole scanning system becomes quite big and also is very susceptible to vibrations and shock. Um, where in our design, the point of rotation is on the mirror surface or just below it. And uh, that means you are rotating a, around the center of mass, which is very reliable in terms of shock and vibration um, and creates a super compact solution. Um, and we're also precise. We are though not quite as fast as Galvo mirrors, which have been fine tuned and optimized for speed over the last decades, um, but there's still something to do for our future roadmap there. Then, the beam shifters uh, to be used for super resolution, as mentioned, tilting a glass offsets the beam or the light. And so you can literally move an image sideways. And so if you move by half a pixel, you bring in the next image, you again move by half a pixel, then comes the next image. What you get in the end is a, a simple way to quadruple the resolution. Um, so from a um, projector system, for example, which has an imager with um, full HD resolution, that's 1080p on the bottom left, you can bump that up to a 4K resolution, uh, really quadrupling the, the resolution. And this is real, okay? It's not just, you're, of course, you're tricking the eye because it's time sequential, but it's super fast. So you actually have those uh, 4,000 uh, or like 8 million in the end pixels on the screen. Um, just that they're time sequential, which also works by the way, um, color that you see on the screen is also time sequential in many systems, especially DLPs. And this has been designed for use with DLP, but can also be used with cameras and, and other uh, systems. Um, so it's, uh, it's actually much lower cost to use this kind of device than to step up to the next higher res native resolution because on semiconductor devices like a DLP, you will have an exponential price increase because of the yield loss that goes up with area. So actually it's really smart uh, way to do that. Now we have to transition fairly fast because you don't want to have um, any smearing between the pixels. So that's a key spec where we're in the range of a millisecond. Um, low acoustic no noise is important, so there we're in the range of 20, 22 decibels, which is basically not audible. 
um, because nobody wants to have a, a noisy uh, laser TV or projector at home. Um, and we have a long lifetime. Again, this is a system with a steel spring, which basically just, you know, oscillates um, without any friction. So we can really propose um, 10 thousands of hours of lifetime. Okay, now our markets, where do we use all these components? Um, and this is a nice thing about optics. Optics is very diverse, right? You can use optics in a whole bunch of applications. And that's also what makes it so exciting to be selling our products because one day you speak to a customer in machine vision who's using our lens and the other day you have somebody who wants to use the exact same product for a laser application for something completely different. Um, so it's really exciting to learn about all these applications. Now the main clusters are um, machine vision and microscopy which is imaging with our lens. Uh, then there's medical devices and especially ophthalmology is kind of a subset of medical. These are devices uh, you would see at the eye doctors um, to do diagnosis where you, you know, look through and uh, yeah, work with the human eye. Um, then laser processing is another cluster where you use the lens for high power laser marking, for example. Then we have the projectors which is mainly the beam uh, shifting that we mentioned here and um, speckle reduction. And then uh, augmented and virtual reality, here we are working on projects with liquid lenses to do three-dimensional, I mean, uh, correct 3D, I'll talk about that in a minute. And with automotive, uh, there uh, you can see a bit of imaging applications, but also mainly LiDAR as an application for the mirror where you need to scan the field of view uh, to do a distance measurement with a laser. Thank you, Mark. I will just keep it very quick that you also have a impression how it is to how we work together and how our company culture is. Um, so just very broad overview. This slide actually shows already a lot. Uh, it's just a collage of some events we do. I would say in short, um, our culture or our um, get together is very collegial so we really do a lot of things together um, there is the weekly Friday beer on our terrace for example um, we have she days um, we have many operas um, we have team events like you see here some hiking groups or we also had uh, one time a uh, um, laser tackle um, game uh, we have also float to work which is and we go once per year with the gummy boat um, from Zurich to Dietikon, which is also quite funny. Or in the top right, you see Opto Rocket, where we build uh, once per year like a, a rocket competition, different criteria, whose rocket wins. <laughs> and um, there are also many colleagues are participating there. Yeah, I would say this summarizes a lot. So people really spend a lot of time together also off the work. Um, and yeah, many young well-educated people with um, similar interests i would summarize a summary slide of our culture which is like made of our values um, so the values which really which we defined to really live the value and which we also do um, of course pioneership um, as an innovative company uh, this is someone everyone um, is interested in, in the topic to do so it's also essential for um, our mission or to fulfill our mission um, which uh, Mark said at the beginning uh, positive mindset is also important to believe in our future applications for example and also makes it much funnier to work together um, respect which I really see every day that people are not shouting to each other in the floor. I think it's a very respectful company culture. Um, ownership is very important in a, let's say, still not startup, but smaller company with maybe less responsibilities where you really need to take ownership. And we really also want people that want to take ownership and um, change something and um, influence something. I think this is very important um, and of course we need to be profitable which we did from the beginning and this is of course also important um, here uh, overview about what roles we have um, 
and what backgrounds are needed for these roles. Uh, I think for you, of course, the R&D and also marketing and sales part is important. We do have like the whole um, spectrum of jobs, like the support functions like me and finance people. Um, we have operations, so we have a big manufacturing area where we of course have many operators and um, yeah, people working in manufacturing. Um, so for you, more interesting, of course, the R&D parts. There we have really the full spectrum from CAD, uh, designing mechanical engineer, for example. Um, we need experts in materials. We need people testing the stuff, um, like the technicians, for example, um, product development engineers. Um, we need to define the processes that they, they function and that they are like um, usable for many different pro um, products and that they are efficient. Yeah, this is just a, a last shout out before we go to the Q&A. Um, since we have a, a new homepage, which I really like. Um, so if you want to deepen our new knowledge or know more, we have there many videos also how it is to work at Optitune. We have, um, again, more detailed um, information about our products and everything and the corporate culture, our positions. So yeah, take a look there and also on our YouTube channel. Um, we have quite a bunch of videos um, which um, gathered during the years. So it's also a very good possibility to get more information. Thank you for your patience. Now we go to a more active part. Um, I would just open the, the Q&A section. Okay. Well, I think the presentation was very clear. Uh, actually, I will have a more like practical question on the hiring process. How does it work for you? Uh, yeah, the hiring process is um, the, basically you have the open applications. Um, mostly, of course, you can also uh, apply spontaneously. We also have a spontaneous application, which is always open, um, where we have like gather interesting profiles um, and stay in contact. Um, and yeah, for the normal application, just apply and you will get an answer always. <laughs> and then uh, we mostly start with a uh, a normal interview by video or face to face and then it really depends on the position mostly we also have kind of a, a case study for engineers application engineers where we uh, also want to get a little bit impression of the technical knowledge um, and of course we also have parts where we uh, show or like get to know colleagues and show around um, in the company to get an impression there so it's very individual um, but it starts with applying um, quite easy to the position. And how long does it take the process? This also depends on the position. I would say averagely um, three weeks. I mean, first answer will be within one week and then all together would be three to four weeks. Okay. Yeah, and sometimes if there's not a position open but somebody has an interesting profile i mean we have also in the past generated jobs because we found somebody with a skill set that we think hmm, we don't get that every day so maybe we can you know uh find a task because generally we have a lot to do <laughs> so there's usually not a lack of uh, interest in getting people on board um so sometimes we can also push a little bit um yeah but we can actually also start with the next part if you want and we also have as you know a second Q&A session um, which is more headed to Michi if you want to know like things that or how he experienced his career so far or, or yeah, what challenges he had and that you can also ask there maybe general questions again if something pops up to your mind in the meantime. <laughs> 